the community development finance lab um, has been kind of a nexus of a bunch of worlds that are connected and the further we get along in our relationships it's like oh yeah I know that person do you know that person oh yeah but you don't know this person and so it's just another one of these networking events I think where if we really start to talk to each other we'll find that we have a lot of worlds in common and we can continue to share information and resources and be helpful to each other so I'm Blaze Rustello I'm the director of the Milano Community Development Finance Lab and um, this event is really a midpoint for the Finance Lab in a two-year initiative that the Greater New Orleans Foundation and the Ford Foundation are supporting um, a partnership with Milano and the University of New Orleans in, in New Orleans. And the, the real goal of that partnership is to take the curriculum that we've developed over the last 10 years at Milano in Community Development Finance and share it and adapt it and have it built upon the existing curriculum that exists within the planning school and the public administration school at the university down in New Orleans. And so we are 10 months into that process. We're learning a lot. We're learning about the context in New Orleans and how the things uh, that we do here in New York and the way our curriculum is structured works and doesn't in New Orleans. Um, we're learning and we've been working on projects from Milano in New Orleans for the last three years. So we're starting to understand the constraints, the opportunities in New Orleans. We're understanding the different relationships and the different resources there. And the goal at the end of this partnership is to really say, can this be adopted and adapted in other places across the country? What are the common elements that make a curriculum work? What are the common elements that make an institution, a higher education institution that's working on real projects with community partners work? Um, what are the challenges because things turn over? So those are the kinds of questions that we're going to talk about throughout the whole entire day. But that gives you a, a, a context of, of where we're at. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jerry Maldonado, who is program officer in the Metropolitan Opportunity Unit at the Ford Foundation. And he was gracious enough to have the Ford Foundation host this event and support the initiative that we're working on. Thank you, Jerry. And um, Jerry's been a long time. Uh, partner and uh, well Ford Foundation has been a longtime partner of a lot of research that Milano has been involved in in the community development world. Um, at, at Lisa Servon who's the dean of our school who if you haven't all know, gotten a chance to meet or know, um, Lisa can you raise your hand? Um, Lisa has done a significant amount of research in the community development area and specifically around capacity building with the Community Development Research Center which used to exist at Milano. And today is really about capacity building. I think as you, as we go through the program, you'll understand that really what we're trying to get out of today is to understand how does the higher education institution work as a capacity building mechanism in the field of community development. So I'm going to turn it over to Jerry and have Jerry uh, speak a little bit about the Metropolitan Opportunity Unit, why he was interested in the work that we were doing and why the Ford Foundation was interested in supporting the Community Development Finance Lab. So, Jerry. So, thank you guys for coming, you know, on behalf of the Ford Foundation and Milano. I just wanted to take the opportunity to welcome you guys for traveling near and far <laughs> for joining us this afternoon as I think we celebrate some of the accomplishments of the lab to date, but also really look forward, as Blaze said, um, and really try to identify some specific opportunities and strategies for helping to build capacity and promote innovation in the community development finance field. As a social justice foundation, Ford has a long-term historical commitment to building the capacity of local community-based organizations to advocate for and implement strategies that increase opportunities for low-income and communities of color. 
Over the past three decades, as many of you know, Ford's played a, an important role in helping to professionalize the CDC and CDFI field and build national intermediaries. The results bring the creation of vibrant networks of, CBA, of community based organizations working valiantly to affect change at the neighborhood uh, and community level across the country. Yet, despite this progress, there remain a number of significant persistent challenges, including growing regional inequalities and spatial and often highly racialized concentration of poverty across the country. Most significantly, the national foreclosure crisis and credit crisis has threatened to undermine much of the progress that's been made in the field in terms of building assets for communities of color. And in fact, the recent crisis represents one of the largest uh, loss of wealth among communities of colors in US history. So in response to some of these challenges, the Ford Foundation's recently launched its Metropolitan Opportunity Program, of which I'm a program officer, and I have another colleague of mine, Lisa Davis. Lisa, if you're here, you can raise your hand. Okay, well she, uh, who's also part of the unit. The mission of the unit is really to connect low-income residents with opportunities in the broader metropolitan economy through more integrated approaches to housing, transportation, and land use planning. As one of the largest domestic place-based uh, place programs at the foundation, we work both at the national level and in select metro areas across the country, including New Orleans, Detroit, San Francisco, and Boston. So it's in this context that we've partnered with Milano's Community Development Finance Program and the University of New Orleans to incubate a CDFL program in New Orleans aimed at building long-term capacity in the Gulf Coast region. A key objective of our programming is to help build the capacity of local community development advocates and practitioners to develop and implement catalytic projects uh, in housing, transit-oriented development, and land use that promote regional equity and opportunity. So why have we partnered with Milano on this effort? As you know, over the past 10 years, Milano's Community Development Finance Lab uh, and its curriculum model have provided really critical technical assistance and capacity to community-based nonprofits and helped build a pipeline of community development professionals equipped with a, multiply, uh, a multidisciplinary set of skills. To date, Milano's engaged 27 community-based organizations in New York, Newark, Camden, New Orleans, provided technical assistance worth more than a million dollars. And as a result of Milano CDF Lab Consulting Clinic, community-based organizations have been able to successfully attract financing for mixed use and affordable housing projects and community and cultural development facilities. And equally significantly, and I think this is really important in terms of values, Ford and Milano's program share an important set of common principles and aspirations, including a commitment to promoting equity in policy, planning and development, an understanding of the importance of balancing social and public as well as financial return on investments, a commitment to diversity and promoting meaningful partnerships across the public and private sector, and a commitment to building the long-term capacity of local leadership. And so while Milano has played a really critical role in building individual leadership capacity in diverse communities so far, we believe that our partnership with UNO in this next phase represents a really critical step in the evolution of the program and in building a set of institutional champions and leaders that can in turn generate their own pipeline of CDFI professionals working towards broader social justice objectives in key regions across the country. And so this afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to hear from a diverse set of Milano's partners, practitioners, and clients from across the country as we both, again, celebrate some of the success stories, continue to identify some of the challenges and opportunities in really building the field. And so again, I really just wanted to thank you guys for joining us this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and so I'm going to move on to the next person on the agenda, who is a longtime friend, colleague, associate, and a graduate of the Milano Finance Lab program. Amber Seeley um, really had the, for, the foresight and the vision in terms of bringing the resources of the Community Development Finance Lab into New Orleans. Amber after graduating from Milano, uh, became a CureX Fellowship, uh, CureX Fellow from the University of Pennsylvania, 
uh, Center for Urban Redevelopment Excellence. Uh, and all of the fellows, there's other fellows in the room too, uh, from past years, I know. Uh, all of the fellows were placed in New Orleans shortly after Katrina. It's a capacity building program where they do urban redevelopment, um, finance and capacity building training for professionals and then they place them within organizations and they were paying for the first two years of placement within these organizations. So the Curex Fellowship was Amber's entry into New Orleans and shortly as she was shortly after she went through the program, matriculated through the program and was placed at Volunteers of America, she called up the, the, the community development finance lab and said, hey, I really need some help with some of the projects that I'm working on here. And we said, okay, we'll look at coming down. And so that was the first project that we worked on. And since that time, we've, we've been able to do four projects in New Orleans. But it wasn't until you know, until we really thought about partnering with a local institution that we were able to build the capacity uh, and, and do it in, in a way that has longer term impact and has more impact than what Milano could provide in, uh, from New York City. So Amber, uh, along with some other Curex fellows and I, we, we sat down one day uh, at dinner and said, how do, we, how do we actually do that? How do we actually take what the resources that we've been employing throughout New York and helping CDCs build capacity and move projects along. How do we do it in a way in New Orleans that isn't just one project a year, one off? And we said, you know, let's let's look at a local institution. What's the right local institution to partner with? And so Amber, along with other people that aren't able to join us from New Orleans, Jessica Venegas, my colleague Denise Beal, uh, we really kind of together came up with the, the strategy to say, let's partner with the University of New Orleans. So I'm, I'm heavily indebted to Amber and her, her force, just her vision really of, of, of what, what the finance lab could provide in New Orleans. Um, and so Amber, uh, what else do I want to say about Amber? I, I could go on and on and I'll stop. But Amber just recently launched a new company um, called Spark Insights with four other colleagues of hers. And it is a market analysis research firm. If you, uh, all of the details in the bio. And Amber really, I think, is recognizing in New Orleans one of the persistent challenges for advancing projects is good data. There's not good market data. There's not good data on population, um, what the population, uh, what the dynamics of the population are. Uh, there's not good information or reliable information about who's come back and who hasn't. And all of those challenges to the, to, to the data itself really are reflected in, in the kinds of questions that bankers and investors and people who want to build projects in New Orleans, um, they, they recognize this and they say, well, we're not really sure. You, you know, and, and right now there's a, a big debate in New Orleans around the supply of housing that they've built and whether or not there, there's enough housing for everybody or whether there's way too much housing. And nobody really knows the answer to that question. Um, and so Amber and her company um, are working diligently with research companies across the country to figure out how you're going to address that, how they're going to address the data that's coming out in the census 2010, and where are the private sources of data that are going to provide that reliable data for investors, bankers, and financiers so that we know with more certainty what the viability of the projects really are. So Amber, um, I, I can't thank you enough for flying here from New Orleans, taking the time out of the day, and I really appreciate um, your ability to, to come and to speak to us about um, your experience within the lab and then how you've been able to trans translate that experience to New Orleans. So, thank you. Well, thanks, Blaze. I need to hire you to do my sales pitch for my business. That was great. Um, 
You know, I was thinking about what um, I could say to y'all about uh, my experience with the finance lab, and I felt like maybe I'm a little bit like the Rogaine commercial, you know, the guy who says, I don't just own the company, I'm a client too. Because um, I'm not only a product of the Community Development Finance Lab, but now I'm a, a client and I continue to be involved in different ways. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of background on me, and, and Blaze covered a lot, so I can zip right through that. Um, kind of talk about what I see as uh, the void in the industry that the Community Development Finance Lab fulfills and um, how it fosters a, a community of professionals and then uh, what I see is going to be the next 10 years in New Orleans and there are so many people from New Orleans in the audience you all must be generous with me I don't have uh, you know I think we could all talk about what we think will happen in the next 10 years so it's just my perspective um, so I am, was a Milano student from 2005 to 2007 in the uh, Urban Policy Program and also Community Development Finance Fellow during that time. And um, at, uh, while I was a part of the lab, I worked on a few analysis projects. Um, one was for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey studying a passenger rail tunnel versus a uh, freight rail tunnel and doing a community um, or cost-benefit analysis to make a recommendation about which was the best use of resources and also worked on a, a plan for dress for success in the Bronx so it was kind of a, a wide variety on the the analysis side and I was a fellow during a transitional time for uh, the the finance lab so it's, it's great to see it being here at the Ford Foundation it's a great kind of moment um, I came in at a transition in uh, staffing and programming um, and for the finance lab, I worked on uh, two projects when I was a student. One was for the Urban League in New York. They had a headquarters building in West Harlem that they wanted a feasibility analysis on different uh, development opportunities. And I worked um, on with the New York City Economic Development Corporation on the supply and demand for small business capital in New York City. I also had the fortune, uh, good fortune, of being a member of a Chase Community Development Competition team for uh, our client was the Fortune Society, which also had a, a property in West Harlem, which I am very happy to say, not only did we win the competition, but that project is actually under construction now. So these, these things really do result in, uh, in tangible progress. Um, and my last semester at New Orleans, I took a class taught by Peter Isinger on post-Katrina New Orleans, and it's the only time that class was taught, so it was perfect timing for me, um, and ended up being a, a good move. And uh, I was working on a economic development strategies for the city as a whole, and was one of those many groups of students who are coming down during your spring break to study the local market and talk to people. and. Um, I just kind of got a sense about the place. I was really intrigued by the city. I, in, raise your hand if you've been to New Orleans. Let's see. Wow, <laughs> practically everybody. So you, you all kind of know what I'm talking about. It's just such a unique kind of culture and um, you know, in, in a post-Katrina setting, it's, it's a very engaged uh, citizenry. So people actually really care about land use and development in their neighborhood, which you can't say for every place, and you're just kind of in this silo off on the side, but it's everyday citizens of the city who are coming to meetings and, and wanting to know what's going on and are involved in the process. And I felt like I was graduating with this skill set in finance and I could be some real use down there as well as um, having a great life, which I do. Um, so that's, um, as Blaze said, uh, I I uh, came to New Orleans as part of the University of Pennsylvania Center for Urban Redevelopment Excellence program through a fellowship that was sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. So we were called Rockefeller Foundation Redevelopment Fellows. And as Blaze said, some of them are here also, and uh, the bosses of some of them are here also. And um, through that program, it was um, 25 kind of mid-career professionals from across the country. We all moved to New Orleans in a crazy like six-week period um, that was incredibly stressful, but we all kind of had a sense that this was what we should be doing, so we made that happen. And uh, we went through an intense um, uh, academic coursework together where we really forged some relationships and were able to kind of talk big picture and philosophically about what we thought development should be. And it was, uh, we were from uh, public sector, nonprofit, for-profit development companies, all within the world of community development. And that really laid a great foundation for us as we were all new to the city and new to the challenges of New Orleans to kind of have a network of people with whom we could talk about these things and, and learn from. 
And uh, through the fellowship, I took a position with uh, Renaissance Neighborhood Development Corporation, which is a, a local subsidiary of Volunteers of America. And we're kind of um, something unique within Volunteers of America. Nationally, the organization has uh, 20,000 units in their portfolio. Uh, but after Katrina, they wanted a, a local development presence. So this is kind of a, a unique opportunity to be local and also to do, um, uh, Volunteers of America does mostly special needs housing, so 202s and 811s, elderly and special needs. And uh, our mission was to create a thousand units of affordable housing in a mixed income and, and workforce development context. And um, we, uh, and I'm happy to say this, and as I was writing this down, I was like, wow, all right, this is, this is pretty good. We've done, we've done all right. We have uh, 200 units that are currently in the lease-up phase, 150 units nearing construction completion, 94 units starting construction, and another 240 units in pre-development. And did I mention that we have three employees in this organization? Let me see the numbers again. 200 units in lease up, 150 near construction completion. Um, so we, we've been a little busy. We've had our hands full. Um, but as you can imagine, with that much going on and with a three-member staff, you have to be really versatile and be able to do a number of things. And I feel like that's where um, the finance lab has maybe lended um, some of the best resources for me to pull on from that uh, for this type of work. Um, most importantly, through the actual hard skill set of pro formas and financial analysis that you need to have under your belt to be able to make these things come to fruition and talk with some sort of cognizance with funders and, and banks and potential investors. But it's also the skill set that you learn when you're part of the finance lab where you are you're learning all the numbers, you're learning how to do this, but you're also meeting with the community. You're um, trying to assess an organization's capacity to perform work and do work. You're making PowerPoint presentations, you're writing you know, document reports, and you're presenting it, and you're talking about it, and you're figuring out how this can be implemented. And that kind of versatility and skill sets is incredibly important for this kind of work because a lot of organizations who do community development are nonprofits and are strapped for staff, and it's uh, and, and challenged for, for resources. So it's really important that you have a variety of skill sets. And the financing, of course, is the most important and most unique skill set you get from the finance lab. But it's also all the, all the presentation components that you get along with it. And I think, um, you know, part of the Rockefeller Foundation, it was 25 mid-career professionals, very impressive people. Um, I'm not sure why I got to be a part of them, but I'm very glad to be one. Um, I was the only one that had ever seen a pro forma when the program started. So it was um, kind of a shock that there were all these people who were doing community development and, and redevelopment and urban planning all across the country and, and don't know how the financing works and how you bring something to, to fruition. So I ended up becoming a tutor for my classmates um, and how to, how to make all these numbers work. And now there's a, a new generation of the fellows that uh, I've been a tutor to as well on the financing piece. And so it's a really, it's a really powerful skill set to have and it's really, it's really valuable. And I think um, one of the great things about the finance lab is you're taking the coursework, so you're learning the hard skills, while you're also trying to implement it and, and do the work for clients. So you're applying it while you're learning it, and that helps you learn it a lot better um, uh, instead of just taking the classes on their, on, on their own. Um, so, you know, I think the, the biggest void in the industry that the finance lab fills are those hard skills, but it's also being a kind of a well-rounded community development player. And I think another thing that it does is it helps foster this community of professionals. Um, as a very wise woman uh, named Denise Beal said, um, to do community development, you have to be in a community. And, you know, we are... Um, the, the relationships that you build as part of the finance lab, no matter how you're involved, if you're a student, if you're a faculty advisor, if you're a client, if you're a funder, you build these relationships with folks who are the up and coming leaders, who are the students, um, but you also get to know other folks in the field that you might not have had the opportunity to, to understand before. Um, when I graduated um, for the Milano graduation ceremony, the dean at the time, Fred Hochberg, um, had a speech, and part of his speech was showing a clip from the movie Good Night and Good Luck. Do you guys know that movie? Um, and there he was 
fortunately there were malfunctions and the sound did not work quite right. But the clip he was showing was um, right before Edward R. Murray Morrow was going to go on the air and say, and stand up against McCarthyism, he had a cigarette first um, with his good friend who was like, all right, this is the right thing to do. Let's talk through it. How do you want to approach it? And their, their closeness and their friendship is what Fred was encouraging us all to foster for ourselves. And it really made an impact on me because I thought it was a really interesting thing to emphasize to a group of people who are graduating. And I, I think that um, he was right on the money because in this kind of work, it can be so hard and it can be so exhausting. And you get into a lot of situations that you don't really know how to handle and you have to constantly evaluate what are my motives? What do I want to accomplish? How much am I here to um, you know, uh, get a deal done and how much am I here to, to serve the community and am I crossing the line and what's a new way to approach this? And you need the people around around you who can say, you know what, you are doing the right thing, or you know what, you're stuck and you're beating your head against the brick wall, you might want to think about this, or you might want to think about another way to approach it. Um, and you need those people, you know, not, not just to give you ideas, but to provide the support that you need to, to get this kind of work done, and the kind of people who will be in a very contentious city council meeting with you and just kind of reach over and pat you, or kind of hold your hand and be like, you know what, you're, you're going to get through this, or actually fend off blows, which has happened um, in New Orleans city council meetings. <laughs> you can really um, stand up for each other in, in many uh, senses of the term. Um, and I think part of the, what's great about being in a community of professionals and, and fostering a community of people around you, it's not just networking, it's, it's so much more than that. It's not just saying, hey, what do you do? You know, what resources can you do for what I'm doing right now? It's, it's finding the people that you're kindred spirits with and the people that you share a common vision with. Um, just yesterday, I went to the office of one of my friends who's working on the redevelopment of one of the public housing uh, projects in New Orleans. And she's like, we have, we have to do phase two, and I need to know everything you know about finance, about all the financial resources that are available. And I was like, all right, well, there's this program, and there's this program, but you have to do this, and you have to, you know, it's not really good for New Orleans, so you have to think about this other thing. She said, you know, it's funny. I told my boss that I was going to talk to you, and he seemed so shocked. Like, you're going to go to what, in other people's eyes, would be a competitor, a com an organization that's going to compete for the same resources, and you're going to share information? Really? And she was like, yeah. She's like, just you watch. I'll come back to you tomorrow with all I need to know, and I couldn't have done it in an afternoon without, without connecting to this friendship. And I think that, you know, we were able to do that because we are not in it for our organization. We're not in it for what we can accomplish. We're in it because we share a vision. We want to see New Orleans redeveloped. We want to see affordable housing available to all the incomes in New Orleans. We want to see equity happen. You know, We want to see things change. And when you have that in common and you share that, it's, it's very powerful. You're going to cry, Emily. Don't cry. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's really important, and I think it's not just the touchy-feely kind of thing that of, of being a part of a community of professionals. It also comes along that they challenge you when you weren't expecting it. Like me saying to Blaze, why don't you guys come down and do something in New Orleans? You know, Milano had never thought about coming to New Orleans, and now look where we are. It's a, it's a great kind of combination. And, um, you know, part of the, the Rockefeller Foundation Redevelopment Fellowship, when it was over, the Rockefeller Foundation said, we're so pleased with what you and your colleagues have been able to accomplish. And whenever we have a feedback session, you guys are so full of ideas and you sound very entrepreneurial. Now we want you to um, you know, make some action out of those words. And they gave a grant into a business competition pool to address a barrier to affordable housing. And it was an amazing opportunity. How often do people kind of call you on your crap and say, all right, you have all these opinions about how it could be different? All right, let's see it. Put together a business proposal, let's do it. So at the time, I was going along in my job, loving what I was doing. Starting a business was not necessarily on the horizon for me, but I was really challenged through this community of professionals to think about something different, to think about another way to approach the kind of change that I want to be a part of in the world. And uh, that's how I started Spark Insights, with this community of professionals, with all these different skill sets that I don't have that we could pull together and make a really great business out of it. So I think that the, the community of professionals that you can become a part of and be a part of as part of the finance lab, it's not just networking and it's not just the touchy-feely stuff. It's meeting the next generation of leaders 
careers. It's finding out new ideas. It's being challenged to try something that you probably would not have done without uh, someone kind of pushing you and, and sharing your vision. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to talk about with that kind of in mind is what are the next 10 years going to be like in New Orleans? And it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, New Orleans is, it's so many things and, you know, we're, we're almost on the five-year anniversary of Katrina and we've all been working so hard and there's so much progress you can see. Come down, I don't know when the last time you were in New Orleans was, but come down and see the progress. Um, but there are always setbacks. And there are always surprises, like the oil spill. Um, something we could not have predicted was going to hit us five years into our recovery. And it's still not certain how exactly it's going to impact our work in the longer term recovery of New Orleans. Um, but you know, kind of in the, in the, the bigger picture, our, our bailout package came a couple years before the economy fell apart. And we have, it was this huge infusion of, of cash and resources and all the organizations kind of had to step up and grow and, and bring in some more people to be able to um, take advantage of these and, and tackle some of this very hard work that was coming our way. Um, and now we've, we've worked through a lot of those resources. A lot of those uh, disaster recovery funds are gone. They're spent and they're invested, um, especially when it comes to, to housing. And we're back to normal, um, back to kind of small allocations of annual community development block grants, small allocations based on per capita for low income housing tax credits. And we're now facing this world that looks very different from, we've got so much to do, we've got all the resources, we just need to put them together. Now it's, well, we still have a lot to do. And we're back to a lot more uh, restricted kind of future for, for funding. So I think a lot of um, the changes that we're going to see are more smaller scale, modest initiatives in New Orleans. Um, you know, some of the developments I've been working on are 150, 200 units. I think the days of those big developments are gone. Um, I think we have to be a lot more realistic about, about what we're going to be able to accomplish. And I think for funders, it also means uh, adjusting your expectations for what you're going to kind of see. Everybody wants scale, everybody wants impact, but I think the, the scale and impact that may be right for New Orleans is, is getting smaller than it has been in the past. And I think it's, it's going to be a lot more about leveraging the assets that you have and collaborating with other folks. Um, you know, a lot of the collaboration that we've been able to build as fellows, just like I was saying, I was telling my friend all about these different funding resources, that kind of collaboration and cooperation between organizations just did not exist in New Orleans uh, before we came. It was very, you know, it was a small city with small resources and a lot of um, organizations were working in silos and fighting over small and smaller pieces of the pie. And I think that there is an opportunity, you know, there's a lot of do-gooders who've come in, but now some of them have been weeded out. There's kind of a concentrated, you know, group of people who are really committed to continuing the work. And I think we're going to have to learn how to work together. I have an organization with huge guarantee capacities. Uh, you have a piece of property that you own or you have site control. Let's work together and let's, let's do something together. And I think that's why this is a fantastic time for the finance lab to be starting at UNL because we need more help to form the relationships and bring organizations together and be able to, f to understand the resources that each organization has and how they might partner together. And it's just, it's building a, a community of more, more cooperation and more collaboration between organizations. And I think that's, it's going to be a challenge, but I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity for the organizations that are there, some great people that are there, um, a lot of interest from outside folks, and I think that there's a lot that we can do. I think, um, well, I hate to say it, maybe the silver lining of the oil spill is that there may be some, <clears throat> another infusion of economic development in New Orleans, or a lot of industry around dealing with the oil spill in the aftermath that gets centered in New Orleans, or the jobs or the people will be centered in New Orleans. And, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Certainly wish the oil spill hadn't happened, um, but there, there may be an opportunity there to kind of build some more um, environmentally sustainable uh, practices and industries and business around uh, addressing the oil spill. So I think that's something that perhaps we can look forward to, even though we still don't know what, what all that's going to mean for us. But um, so that's, that's it. Those are, those are my thoughts on where we're going with New Orleans. I can't wait to hear about the panels and and how people feel about um, kind of the future of the finance lab and the role the finance lab is going to play in New Orleans.
Thank you, Amber. So I'm going to take a breath. It's been a it's been a long day, and uh, we came from Bedford Stuyvesant this morning. A group of faculty from the University of New Orleans. Denise Beal, who's my colleague. Denise, will you raise your hand? And. Um, and we were looking at a health clinic that Ulysses Kilgore has just about finished with. He's the president and CEO of Bedford Stuyvesant Family Health Center. And it's a project that the finance lab worked on six years ago. And to see the building built, to see the additional capacity this organization is going to be able to provide from moving from 10,000 square feet to 38,000 square feet, it's it finally, it finally makes uh, you stop for a second and say, "Wow, you know, this is all worth the the time and effort that we put into the work that we do." Um, so, I know we started a little bit late. I have a couple of things I want to say just to put this com these two panel conversations in the context um, of what I think is really happening on a macro level in community development finance. And I also want to tell you a little bit about my story and how the hell I even got to New York and why I'm even sitting where I'm sitting. Because sometimes I get so busy trying to put people together do transactions, help make connections, um, that I need to just stop and, 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 and relate to people and say, thank you. Thank you all for coming here. Um, and I, I especially want to thank a couple individuals in the room. Um, I want to thank Lisa Servan, dean of our school, Louis Dorf, for your support, your guidance, and, and, and your leadership in helping to shepherd this program um, from where it was five years ago to where it is today. So thank you very much. I want to thank Jerry and Lisa Davis at the Ford Foundation and the Greater New Orleans Foundation for supporting this work. Um, I will also want to thank Denise Beal and her vision. Um, without Denise, I would have never um, been able to forge the kinds of relationships um, that we've been able to for, uh, forge with the University of New Orleans. Um, and so I want to thank Denise. And there are so many others, um, but I want to I move the program along. And, and what, what I hope to accomplish today, what, what I would like all of us to, to think about for a second is, you know, why are we gathered together? Why did you come here? I, there was a program that was put together. It had particular questions. It had particular pan panelists. But what sparked your interest to come? Does anybody want to? I want to get like two or three people's perspective on that. Jenny Kramer, why did you come? You wanted to come and meet people. Okay. Okay. How about Charles? Well, I've been listening to you talk about this for the last uh, couple, two, three years, and I realized I haven't really touched the community, um, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to touch people that have actually been in the community and really boots on the ground. Okay. Anybody else? One other perspective? Just to see where people are coming from. Yes. New in community development. Okay. So I hope the program will be able to address all of those questions. Uh, when I was thinking about putting together this event, what I hope and what I hope to accomplish, really three things came to mind. And and the first is I want everybody to have a better understanding of what Community Development Finance Lab is, what it does. We call it a CDFL. You know, who knows about it? Who kind of knows about it? Who knows the projects? So I want you to get a better sense of what are the projects that we do, who do we interact with, and what exactly is the Finance Lab doing? The second thing I want to hopefully accomplish today is for you to get a sense of conviction about the work that you're all doing. Right, to stop for a second and say, this is a Friday afternoon. Let's put away our blackberries. Let's not go back to the office. 
we have to pick up our kids in the afternoon, okay. But let's, let's spend some time just thinking and interacting with each other about what is the finance lab doing and how can I be a part of it? We all have different talents. We all have different skill sets. And I, al I always want to try and figure out what's the best way to utilize those. What are the best ways to, for, for us to, to, to work together? So that's the second thing I would hope that could come out of today. And it's not just money. It's not just your time. It might be your knowledge. It might be your encouragement for somebody who's coming out of the program to just give them some direction um, of where the different opportunities are for them. It might be sharing the critical moments in your professional development career that really changed the way you looked at the work you did. It really changed the direction that you were going, because most of the people who come through the finance lab, there are a few people who seek it out. There are a couple. But most of them come, come to Milano, and, and also I think most of the people go to the University of New Orleans because they care deeply about the places that they're living in. They care about the things that the Ford Foundation cares about in terms of equity and social justice. And we all kind of approach that this work with that lens. So out of today, I hope that we can say, you know, why do I do this work? How have I been involved with the finance lab in the past? And how can I potentially be involved in the future? What, what, are, what are the ways that I can contribute some resources, knowledge, time? And the last goal of today is to really welcome everybody from New Orleans. Welcome the University of New Orleans to New York. Learn from all of the work that they're doing in a recovery setting. And to understand the opportunities and strengths of implementing the curriculum at the University of New Orleans. So just five more minutes, if you can bear with me. Um, and it's a little bit to tie the story of my journey to New York in with the journey of what I think is the modern movement of community development finance and where I think community development finance is going in the future. As I said, we just came from Bed-Stuy. And when I first moved to New York 10 years ago, I, I got off the plane. I was going to Milano. And it was a week before school. And they said, let's meet over at this place called Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation and meet with the executive director there. And I had no idea. So I went to Bedford Stuyvesant. And then I sat down with a group of colleagues, cohort of the finance lab. And we met with the executive director of the organization. And I thought, wow, this place is amazing. Wow. I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> I was nervous. I was challenged. But I was, had this sense, this open-mindedness to say, I I'm open. I'm open to the possibility that I could learn from this community. I'm open to the possibility to become part of the community. And I'm open to the possibility to contribute to this community. And I think. Ultimately, that's what makes a community happen. It's, do you take the time to be part of it? Do you take the time to learn people's interests and their relationships? And can you contribute to it? You know, how can you con contribute to it? And so it's appropriate that we're here at the Ford Foundation today because Ford was one of the initial funders of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation back in the 60s. And really, that was, I think, the start of the, what we would call the modern day community development movement. Um, it was started under, you know, with the leadership of Senator Robert Kennedy. And at the time, it was Mayor Lindsay and Jacob Javits. And they all came together and said, 
let's create a model of community development. And I want to read a quote from Senator Kennedy about what he thought was the vision and to, to think about as we're here 40 years later, if this is still true. The program for development at Bedford-Stuyvesant will combine the best of community action and the best of the private enterprise system. Neither by itself is enough, but their in their combination lies the hope for our future. And what, what has happened since then has been a lot of things, but there's really been three or four primary events that have really grown from a grown the community development movement into an industry. Since that time, the movement matured to an industry with the passage of critical policies and legislation, including the Community Reinvestment Act, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 that created the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and the creation of the CDFI fund in 2000. And really the infrastructure that has been established for capital to flow into these communities that were once overlooked and, and disinvested. And so where are we today 40 years later? Well, we have about 1,250 community development finance institutions. We have extremely large financial intermediaries. And together, they've invested over $100 billion in equity capital and several, million, several billion dollars of loan capital. The Opportunity Finance Network, which is the leading network of CDFIs across the country, it's an organization of 170 community development finance institutions. Over the last 20 years, those 170 organizations have originated over $23.5 billion in financing, generated 230,000 units of housing, created 50,000 new businesses, and have built uh, 6,000 community facility projects. Since the inception of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is probably one of the most successful community development finance programs in the country, it's created 1.7 million units of housing and over $75 billion of investment. But, but what do those numbers mean, right? Like Amber said, there's always, foundations are always interested in impact. They're always interested in output. They're always pushing us to think about outcomes. What do those mean? How do lives really get changed? How are people who are living in low-income communities really building equity and assets? And I want to challenge us to think, is, is that really happening? You know, are the CDCs that Ford took a risk in investing in and establishing more than 40 years ago, are they any better off? Are they growing, thriving organizations with more capacity, helping to grow and shape the destiny of their neighborhoods? Do they represent and are they more accountable to the residents in the community? These are the kinds of questions that we tackle at Milano and and push each other to ask the organizations that we work with. And what about the intermediaries? Has their capacity improved? I know their balance sheets have. Their portfolio growth demonstrates significant progress, but how effective have they been in growing the capacity of the community development corporations? That's one of the real charges that they had. How successful have they been? What kinds of capacity are they, are they providing? And where can a higher institution, higher education institution who is training professionals provide additional capacity or fill a void that those intermediaries either aren't doing because they don't have the resources or they're not doing because it's not a focus or a priority? And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the banks. Some of them are here. And when I think about where we are, I'm amazed that a movement in community development and community development finance that was started because bank capital, traditional mainstream financial capital, was not providing capital to communities, was redlining communities, 
was overlooking and disinvesting from communities. And now, they're our biggest partner. <laughs> they provide over 75 to 80% of the debt capital for community development loan funds. And they're an important partner. They're a partner that we should continue to support, to foster, and to provide additional capacity. And I think the capacity that we can provide to the banks is how do we allow the bankers who are in the community development units, which some of them have dissolved as a result of the financial crisis, how can we provide them the data, the stories, the outputs, the outcomes, so that they can provide a compelling story to the highest levels of these massive institutions? Because most of the bankers who operate in this community development finance world are wonderful, talented people who care deeply about community. But they're sitting within an institution that cares about a bottom line, that cares about meeting a hurdle rate, and that cares about the next economic opportunity that is going to get them out of <laughs> the crisis that they're in. So there's competing interests right now with community development finance and the investment opportunities that exist, and several other opportunities where they can put their money. And at the end of the day, we all know in the finance lab, what do people look at? The internal rate of return. And there's a decision that's made on that. And I think that if we recognize where we are right now, we need to support the bankers, we need to support the intermediaries, and we need to support the community development corporations. And so I'm, I'm going to challenge us to think about that. I think there's a real disconnect with the bank capital becoming more global, the bank capital becoming more disconnected from the community. How do we address that? But in spite of all of these challenges, I think, that we're faced with right now, where does the program of a community development finance lab fit in? What's the best kind of capacity we can provide to the community development corporations, to the intermediaries, which, quite frankly, we haven't even done a whole lot with intermediaries, and there might be a big opportunity there. Sometimes I think the, the intermediaries when it, when might look at us like, well, we already do that. We provide capacity. So those kinds of questions I want us to address. And what's the most cost-effective way of building and delivering capacity to communities, intermediaries, and banks? That's what today is about. It is ultimately what the program is about. And as we sit in the present moment, 10 years after the Community Development Finance Lab was established and in the middle of this two-year initiative with the University of New Orleans, we're here to learn and we're here to listen from, from professionals that have decades of experience. And it's not often that we convene a group of intergenerational experience in such a, I mean, the community development world is a pretty small world. And to have several generations all in the same room learning from each other, let's think about how we can best utilize that. We want to listen to your experiences. And more importantly, we want you to help us think about ways we can improve this model as we are going to set forth a strategic vision over the next year for the next 10 years for the Finance Lab. And so before I turn it over to Milano, I'm just going to go through two slides. I want to show um, the successes, the impact. Whether they mean anything, we should, have a, we should, we should talk about it today. Does it work? I'm going to go. We click the, I don't think it works. It's the arrow. I know, there's two clickers. There we go. 
So Community Development Finance Lab is really just curriculum. That's what it is, right? It's when we look under the hood, this is fine. This is fine. When we look under the hood, what is the curriculum built upon? It's really built upon a capstone course, which is the finance lab course. That capstone course has three components to it. We train, we do a technical boot camp in, in the fall, the first two months of, of the semester, where we train the hard skill sets that Amber talked about. We train about community and working in community. We train about, we l learn and listen about all of the policies, the major policies that I just spoke of. And we equip students with the ability to actually tackle the projects they're about to embark on. In November, they get into teams, they work on projects. Today, you're going to hear about a variety of projects. There's real estate-based projects. There's policy-based projects. We're here to help your organization move, advance, provide assistance on the things that you deeply care about and are trying to move forward. And the last thing that we do is we bring all these people together. Seminars, talks, convenings, to learn, to build upon, to continue to build relationships. So what have we been able to do? Jerry spoke briefly about it. Um, and I want to put it in the context of, um, this is the competencies. These are the competencies that we try to have everybody who comes through the program be able to understand, implement, and it's a wide variety of skill sets. And so how, how is that addressing what's on the ground? Lisa Servon did some research when the Finance Lab started in 2000 that looked at a bunch of community development partnerships that Ford had funded and provided support to, to community development corporations all across the country. They interviewed more than 200, and they said, what do you really need in terms of capacity building? What are the kinds of capacity building you actually need? And they came up with five types of capacity building. Maybe you should, can you just sit there for a <laughs> second? Thank you very much. These are the five that they came up with. Resource capacity, political capacity, organizational capacity, network capacity, and programmatic capacity. And when you ask specifically to the organizations what they need, there were five, top five. So and this is the last slide. They needed long-term core funding. Of course, we all do. They needed access to new funding sources. They needed help with strategic planning. They need technical assistance. And they need allies in publicizing the community development agenda with governments and business leaders. So those are what they needed 10 years ago. I hope on the panel, this first panel, which we talked talk to different projects and, and, and programs that we worked with, what do they need today? What do you need in this environment in terms of finance capacity? What do you need in terms of planning? And then in the second panel with the University of New Orleans, I want to learn from all of their experience post Katrina in a place that had a lot of resources, a lot of financial resources, but a lot of constraints. What were the challenges there? What kinds of capacity do the organizations really need to deploy those resources? How effective were the organizations in deploying those resources? So that's the goal of today. I hope that you all get engaged. At the end, Denise is going to facilitate a little group interaction where we're going to ask some questions, and we hope you can provide some input. And I hope you have a wonderful time. So thank you very much. And we're going to move on to the panel. And the first panel is moderated by uh, a dear friend <laughs> who often we get into very, I would say, healthy debates about community development finance, about the role of banks, about whether this program is providing the right kinds of capacity. And Mark Willis has been a supporter of the Finance Lab from the very beginning. He supported the lab while he was at the Chase Bank, 
financially. He supported the lab as an advisor throughout the last 10 years, and even as a resident fellow at New York University, right down the street, he continues to provide support and guidance to the lab, and for that, uh, we're forever grateful, and I appreciate you taking the time to moderate this panel. So if the first panelists could come up, and, uh, and we'll start. So Blaze, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to come here and uh, moderate this excellent panel. I don't think uh, I have any work to do. I, uh, I think it'll all be done by uh, the great folks here. Um, it has been great to be uh, associated with the uh, Finance Lab all these years and see what incredible progress uh, you've been able to make and what a great impact, really, on the community development uh, uh, community here uh, in New York. Camden we're going to talk about and now in New Orleans. So uh, thank you, Ford, uh, for uh, helping to make that, uh, that possible. So uh, we're going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, go through the bios. You've got them uh, in your package of uh, each of these folks, uh, other than to just to say um, that uh, we have uh, Lucille McEwen, a President and CEO of Har Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, HCCI, uh, Brian Siegel, from uh, New York State Housing Finance uh, Agency, um, and also previously with HSBC and many other organizations. In fact, everybody here has an incredible background. And I think part of building that community and building those wide range of skills that are really required to do community development comes from having uh, a, a lot of different uh, experiences along the way, and we'll get to hear uh, more about that. Uh, Dina Levy uh, from uh, the Urban, um, Urban Homesteading Assistance uh, Board, I know as UHAB, and she is the policy director. And uh, Ulysses Kilgore, executive director of bed Family Health Clinic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and um, Dave Foster from the Greater Camden Partnership. We're missing somebody, right? Ulysses. That's what I thought, right? Uh, you all didn't look at me when I said that. <laughs> I think, well, maybe I'm completely lost here. And, um, but we do know that Roger Williams will not be able to make it. Uh, at the last minute, uh, he was unable to come. He is coming. He, is, he should be here. We, were just, we just met with him. So we should okay, be here. all right. The word is. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I'm sure uh, we've heard, I think, uh, from Amber and from uh, Brian, how pr uh, I mean Blaze, how personal uh, the experience is and how personal the commitment uh, to that is and uh, to community development uh, uh, is in, uh, for the people who work in this uh, field. So I think we're going to get a little bit more feeling uh, of that from uh, the people we have here. So. Uh, Brian, I'm uh, going to start with you. Um, let's see, you've worn a lot of different hats here. Uh, They're all connected. Well, you're going to explain that all to us. Mm -hmm. But you were with HSBC, which was a funder. Um, you have, um, I believe, had interns. You are uh, have been an advisor to the organization uh, over uh, over time. You've hired uh, uh, finance lab uh, graduates. Um, so. Uh, really been involved and seen this, but tell us a little bit how you got introduced to the lab and, and how you've continued to, to be involved. It was pure serendipitous or serendipity. I got a call from um, a, a graduate member of the lab who was looking for a summer job. And I knew that Milano had, I get vaguely knew that Milano had a, a program, but I, I just wasn't clued into it. And um, I wasn't really looking to hire a student for the summer either. Um, but I was really impressed with this individual's, um, I don't want to say maturity, but he, he was so clued in when he talked about what his interests were and why he wanted to come work for the summer with at the time I was at the Low Income Investment Fund. Um, and when I interviewed him, what struck me was that there was this really strong blend of rigor, you know, intellectual and financial skills that he clearly had that he was learning um, while he was in the program, that he had real context, that his prior 
uh, internships with through the lab or field experiences had already gotten him out into the New York City community um, and that he had a passion for doing this work and to me, those are the ingredients, the passion, the rigor, the relationships that I think have been hallmarks in my own professional development, in community development, and everyone I work with, and practically everyone who still is in the field, because most are. And that's one of the fantastic things about the field, is it is community, and after all these years, uh, it, it's been great just to look at this particular program and see that it's not only cultivating a new generation of practitioners that are really getting curriculum and skills, but that are um, going to refresh those of us who are in the field with their ideas and their approaches. So I hired um, the individual for the summer and was really pleased with how quickly he stepped up and, and accomplished what we needed him to. And then I hired him. Um, he was finishing a uh, semester early and he stayed with us until he became a pre presidential scholar and left uh, New York to go to HUD. So that was our loss and HUD's gain, but uh, that was the, in the beginning of my uh, in introduction. And then when I moved on to HSBC and I was in that sort of rarefied group of community development financial people, um, uh, we were looking not only to do transactions, but we were thinking a lot about capacity in the communities. And we had a grant program as well. And um, Milano approached us and, and Chase, when you were there, I believe, and other institutions, and w was really pitching the, the value add of the program and how could the banks um, help out. And we really embraced it and provided a grant. And through that, we were able to um, identify one of our own customers, you have Urban Homesteaders Assistance Board, as a, a group that we would like to have, uh, like to be the recipient um, of, a, of a field of experience with the group, and so Dina can speak to that soon. But that was a, that turned out to be, I think, a, an amazing outcome because it wasn't your standard, and there's nothing wrong with standard, but it wasn't just a student assignment with a community development organization working on a deal, on a project, but you had came up with the notion of something that was more about research and, and that could lead to really important advocacy, that could b lead to really important financing strategies to deal with an impending catastrophe, I guess we could so call may, it. Maybe we should yeah. pass this on, hand exactly. this on to uh, Dina, so, tell us a little bit exactly. about Exactly, so I mean, that. that's, th th there but, we go, that's the setup. Right. And we'll come back to you, uh, Brian, to You don't find, even have to. You've you got this talent, you have this great project, but we're gonna wanna hear why you're still involved. So maybe it speaks for itself, but you can talk about that. But Dina, tell us about the project. Sure. So, um, actually, I never really knew exactly how we got so lucky as to get Blaze just one day magically appeared. But, um, <laughs> so, historically, UHAB has made its name by converting uh, rental buildings, distressed rental buildings, into limited equity co-ops that are very, very affordable for all different incomes, but for even the lowest tier income families in New York City. Around 2005, 2006, we started expanding our work into preservation more broadly of affordable housing, primarily in expiring use uh, buildings, whether that was mitchell -Lama, which is a New York State financing program or federally subsidized housing. And through that sort of broad preservation policy work, we started to uncover fairly accidentally a, a new trend that was taking place in the New York City real estate market in which very big private equity firms from all over, both abroad and from around the United States, were showing up and spending oodles and oodles of money to acquire very rent restricted affordable housing, whether it was, like I said, uh, state or federally subsidized housing or whether it was excuse me, rent regulated housing, which is a you know, million units in New York City. Uh, and they were paying, like I said, prices that just seemed completely off the mark in terms of what these buildings could support, both in terms of debt and return on equity and operating the buildings in a decent way. It was new for us and it was also kind of murky and seemed to be tied up in complicated things like derivatives and mortgage-backed securities and things that typical housing advocates don't really know that much about. So we were very fortunate that just at that time, as we were coming to understand the threat, I think at that, around that time we had probably identified about 
8,000 apartments that we thought were caught up in this uh, scandal, crisis, catastrophe. Uh, and Milano came in to help us, the finance lab came in to help us sort of put together some financial uh, models that would help explain what was going on and what the risks were and what the consequence of that over leveraging, which is what we now pretty much call it. We, we named it predatory equity, which I think is uh, apropos, but uh, it's been come to known in New York as over leveraging. And I'll just say before I pass it on, today the crisis has reached about 110,000 apartments in mm -hmm. just New York City. And so this, it? right? <laughs> and, and so they gave you the model, and this oh, is allowed. Oh, should I keep going? I, I can tell yeah, it's a little, learn. just a right. little bit more so, because. Um, so right. So the first thing that we did was, you know, we knew. Five more seconds, but no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, we we knew which buildings we thought had been sort of caught up in this, but we didn't totally have all the financial in information that we needed or the underwriting assumptions that we needed, and so the team, one of whom is here, went and and uh, started to really dig in to sort of lay out. You know what is a healthy financial underwriting scenario look like for a building that has rent restricted incomes, and what would be an unhealthy model, and what are the variances there? And we were then able to take that sort of template, and anytime we discovered a new project or a new portfolio that we thought was at risk, we could just plug in the numbers as we got them, which was a little bit of a struggle also. But then we would be able to sort of show very easily to elected officials, to policymakers, to people in government uh, exactly why these buildings were potentially at risk. So, you know, simply put, there was not enough money to both run the buildings properly and pay the debt service and the equity return. Um, and so we, with those five models, we started sort of plugging in more information and more information. Um, and it was very helpful, not only in terms of getting attention paid to the issue, which early on was sort of, you know, people were accusing us of hyperbole and maybe this wasn't really a big problem. Over time, people started to really uh, accept that this was a real crisis, but also to sort of think Think about policy changes as a result. So, just one example of that: uh, there were using this exact analysis that I just described. We showed what five former uh, state subsidized housing properties that were located in Harlem uh, called the Putnam Portfolio, 4,000 apartments that were serving low and moderate income families, terribly over leveraged. In, their, in the second flip or the second sale of the buildings, they had acquired about a $900 million mortgage, which was just way off the charts. And we used the Milano analysis to show that. Part of our research unearthed that both the city and state pension funds had invested as the equity partner in that deal, which was unfortunate. Um, and we used this information to work out a negotiation with uh, the then comptroller of the city of New York uh, to make an agreement not to invest in these kinds of predatory deals going forward. And that agreement actually was reached and has been replicated subsequently in California by the, well, after unfortunately CalPERS invested in Stytown. But they've subsequently signed something similar about their investment models and have signed off from making investments that would have a negative impact on low income communities. So, so Dina, your group's done a, a fabulous job getting this message out of over leveraging and uh, predatory equity and, and what I'm hearing here is it was Milano who uh, turned out to be sort of your finance department here to come in or an, uh, right. an, an analyst something that I don't understand is a not-for-profit you didn't have a full staff of not even analysts. close yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. nobody right? right I mean and not just that right it's it's sort of they left something that was sort of permanent behind right so it wasn't just looking right. at these five buildings but it was setting up a model where even somebody like me who's done doesn't have a degree from, you know, Milano could still, you know, stick in numbers and come up with an analysis that anybody could understand. And so it's been very useful in terms of ongoing advocacy uh, and bringing this issue to light. Um, great. So, uh, Dave, you've had a great experience, I think, here, um, and we want to hear more about it. But one of the interesting things here is uh, often the groups come to and uh, find out about the finance lab, come and try and get some technical assistance. Um, in your case, just to kind of make a joke of it, you were kind of grabbed by the <laughs> caller by Annie Casey and said, come here. I, I'm not sure you were kicking and streaming about it. How did that all work? And, uh, and then tell us the story of what has happened. Uh, that That's true. Uh, as Dina said, Blaze sort of appeared uh, at one point and said, uh, we're here to help. We, uh, the, the Greater Camden Partnership uh, has a, a broad portfolio of projects, but one of the uh, signature projects that we undertake is the Camden Special Services District, which is a special improvement district, or uh, New York would be called a business improvement district. 
Uh, we had launched uh, sometime prior to, to Blaze's arrival a strategic review of the Special Improvement District very broadly. Uh, and it was fortuitous that the uh, Annie Casey Foundation, who has been a good partner of ours in, in a number of different undertakings, knew of this effort. Uh, Blaze had been reaching out to the Casey Foundation, I believe, at the time and said, uh, we're looking to fund in a way that is consistent with the other work that we're doing. And so, uh, as a result, uh, channeled Blaze to us and, uh, and funded a strategic review of the uh, Special Improvement District, but specifically uh, a look at developing a long-term uh, sustainable financing model for the Improvement District. Just so people understand, it's a little bit like a business improvement district here, except you can't impose fees here, right? So uh, we could. Uh, so tell us. <laughs> we, so the, uh, the Special Improvement District law in New Jersey allows for a variety of funding mechanisms. Uh, the issue in the city of Camden is that we just don't have a property tax base or a, a base of, of property uh, that would allow for an assessment using the typical models that you would use in uh, places in New York City or others. So this, uh, this team arrived, uh, very bright and talented young individuals who had an incredibly creative energy in looking at what are the different models? What are the, what are the universe of possibilities that we could apply to this issue? And came up with some incredible recommendations, but also came up with uh, an identification of, of here's what the gap is likely to be uh, based on your need for operating dollars and if we were to impose uh, any one of these two or three models that looked as though they, they may have been viable uh, and then suggested some, some ways of, of closing that gap. Uh, the the punchline here, and I'll, I'll keep it moving with, with that, is that uh, we recognize that because of, because of who the property owners are, the size of the property owners, uh, tax exempt status, and a number of other things that are happening uh, in the downtown of Camden, uh, the particular model that we would like to impose is not quite ready for prime time yet. We'll go through a tax uh, valuation in the city for the first time in 33 years, I think. Uh, this year, court, court mandated at this point. Uh, and I, I believe that the model will be implementable at that point. But in the uh, short term, our main funders, the main businesses in the downtown who had been contributing on a voluntary basis, looked at the work of the Milano team, uh, understood that there was a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of how this uh, model would play out over time, and all, every single one of our funders, based on the, the work the Milano team did, signed a three-year commitment to continue at their uh, level of voluntary funding uh, to, to bridge the gap to the point where we could put a formal assessment in place. Right. Sounds like that <coughs> a successful outcome. A very <laughs> successful that. outcome, right. absolutely. Uh, and, and we have some uh, some other great uh, stories here. So uh, we turn to uh, Lucille, who I, I guess uh, benefited in some way, uh, at least uh, the finance lab support at that time uh, uh, benefited from uh, some of the support that Chase gave over the years uh, when I was there. Um, so, but I've known Lucille for a long time and it's a terrific organization. <laughs> T tell us uh, uh, how the lab helped you uh, do uh, accomplish uh, uh -huh. and, and where the project stands now. Well, the site is actually on the screen and yeah. we just had a groundbreaking after many, many years. <laughs> Um, I also passed around a couple of pieces of paper. I'm trying to be more green, so I didn't want too many handouts. One really shows all of the sources of funding and the deal, and I just thought you'd pass it around and people could look at it. Everybody doesn't need to take a copy home, you know. <laughs> um, but certainly if you want it, I can email it to you. Um, this was one of the last sites in the Bradhurst Urban Renewal Plan to be redeveloped. It was a difficult site because it had been a former film storage warehouse. That's not where everybody is here from New York, so that's in Harlem. Oh, right? in yeah. Harlem, right? An area that I and remember. And the people from New Orleans came up and saw it yesterday. Oh, they did! Terrific. Okay, and and they know that there were like three thousand vacant apartments. I don't know what number. So when I talk about the Bradhurst Urban Renewal Plan or Redevelopment Plan, it was created in the 
1980s by Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, HCCI, and then later adopted by the city with some variations um, as the urban renewal plan for the area to redevelop approximately 3,000 units. Um, HCCI was also very committed to equitable development, um, which meant that we really want the community to fully participate in planning and sharing in the economic benefit of development and of becoming homeowners when homes are created. So um, this site was one that we wanted to develop as an office. Um, and we started with the Milano um, team working on it for developing the existing building as an office. However, over the years as uh, property prices began to escalate, the community really said, add some housing to this. Don't just do an office. We need more affordable housing. Um, we're concerned about our seniors leaving the community. It ended up as a uh, Section 202. Of course, Section 202 HUD funding no longer fully funds a project. And so even after we received that funding, we had to uh, seek uh, tax credit funding through DHCR, our state housing agency. And then we ended up with additional TCAP funds and several other sources of financing, as you would see on that sheet that I passed around. Everybody so get all those acronyms down? So down. it was HUD, Tax was Credit Assistance Program, which is TCAP, 8.3 million in low income housing tax right. credits, 1.2 million from the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, uh, 151 million from New York State Energy Research Development Authority, or NYSERDA, and that's because we were doing a green building to be LEED certified. And um, 50,000 from the Enterprise Green Communities Program, and 50,000 from the Home Depot Foundation. And that was just for the actual construction. Yeah. Um, the early pre development funding and the assistance from Milano came from um, first the Chase Competition Award, which sort of got everybody interested, bankers at an event seeing what the project is, um, and then allowed us to go and shop for the other money for pre-development. Uh, for pre-development, we had um, a portion of the Enterprise Communities uh, Green Communities Grant, we actually had a fellow at our office who was an architect, an architectural fellow, not just a fellow. <laughs> an architectural fellow, Andy Brooks, who um, was at our office actually for three years through a fellowship, um, um, the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship Program. And he worked on this project extensively with Milano. Um, they worked very closely with me. They worked very closely with my staff. They were extremely professional. You know, as you mentioned earlier, nonprofits often are stuck in that issue of choices, of, you know, answering to all of the multi headed dragons that we have to answer to our funders, our board, the community, and we don't really have time for that sort of long term, very carefully thought out planning. Here we had the opportunity to uh, really work with them to um, develop a great way to present the project to bankers, to other funders, to foundations, and they also gave us sort of the real outline of how to assess different opportunities so that when it didn't initially get funded as the office and we continued to work with the community and over a year or two needs started changing in the community we were then able to say we need to add the housing in this this makes sense so now we will have our health and wellness services servicing that building and the community at the site as well as 65 units of housing for the elderly all right well that's a terrific story and uh uh, we're, we're all invited to the ribbon cutting? Uh, yeah, uh, fall of 2011. There we go. <laughs> all right, that sounds great. So I have some, uh, I, while we wait for our last panelist, uh, uh, it, it's a great project uh, in, uh, in Bed-Stuy, but uh, I, I'm going to leave it to him to explain. Um, I don't know, we have a slide showing the center that just recently opened. We can at least put that slide up.
Manning from the Primary Care Development Corporation. Uh, we're a CDFI and uh, we financed this building which is uh, very close to its opening. Uh, uh, Blaze mentioned it's about a, uh, an increase of four times the space that bed is working with right now. In terms of the finance lab, um, when bed so the space that they're in right now bed Family Health Center is an offshoot of the uh, Restoration Corporation that Blaze mentioned in his introduction. Um, the space that they're in now basically across the street from Restoration Plaza is incredibly overcrowded. They're a very successful uh, health center and community service organization. Um, so they needed, they needed uh, ex to figure out their expansion options and they worked with the finance lab and um, sort of modeled out what their options might be and what they might be able to do, um, what, what they might be able to realistically pursue. I, I understand they actually help create images that people could start to visualize what might happen here, other than just knowing how crowded it was here. I don't know, Blaze, if I'm on the wrong direction. Yeah, when I mean, I, I think, and I, I'm a little worried that Ulysses isn't here. Hopefully he's okay, because he right. was adamant about coming today. Um, and he was very active in that pre-call, so I know he wanted to, <laughs> he had a message <laughs> he, he wanted to get across. He did. Um, so, for the, the two things that he really wanted to speak to today were the images that allowed him to garner financial support, primarily from the city council. Actually, he was able, shortly after the Chase competition proposal, which built on the finance lab proposal, um, and had additional images to raise $5 million from the city. And once the city committed that $5 million worth of money, then it was pretty much the catalyst for bringing everything together. The other um, element to it is we actually did a proposal for condo development on the site. It's a huge site. So it had, it had some extra space. We were proposing building residential units as well. Um, and they were going to use that money and the sale <laughs> proceeds from that money to help finance their clinic. The market turned, as everybody knows. And so they didn't go forth with the residential component, but they built their clinic. The last thing that he would have talked about all day long is the design elements that the students presented that actually they did incorporate into the building. Primarily a waterfall that is beautiful. You walk through the entrance to the building and there's probably a 10 foot by 30 foot wall of water that is gonna just flow as people walk in, you'll probably be able to hear it throughout the entire building. And so I think in three quick points that those were the images and, and, and what he was able to do with those images. That's great. And as long as uh, Tom is up, PCDC, a fabulous organization that works in creating uh, community health uh, facilities here. Um, this, uh, this one is unique in any way amongst all of them or just a great one great example of the work that you do uh, it's a very good example of the work that we do um, it's one of the larger facilities that we have financed um, and it's certainly uh, an example of the the way that community organizations uh, are stretching themselves uh, as they can sometimes uh, to increase the services they provide in their communities did they find you, I don't know, I, always dangerous to ask questions, they find you before they were working with the finance lab or were you guys, Tom, involved from the beginning or not? Um, we were involved from the beginning. Actually, PCDC itself right. was uh, announced at the old Bed-Stuy site um, when we started up as an organization. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> All right. Wow. And uh, Ulysses and I have a conference call at 3 o'clock, so I can only imagine that he's back at the office prepping for that call. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, it's good to get some uh, background on this. Now, Bl Bl Blaze asked me to uh, think about, uh, uh, have the panel think about the set of topics here that uh, uh, I will uh, raise in this way, which is it's clear that the finance lab is perfect. It's done absolutely fabulous uh, <laughs> projects here um, and uh, with a uh, and has all the skills and all the talent that anybody could possibly want. But he asked me to get uh, a little feedback from the panelists in terms of what their needs would be today, how do they la line up with what the, the lab skills are, does the lab need to think of other kinds of skills to bring in here, um, and
in order to make them even more effective in providing the, the fabulous uh, technical assistance uh, that they gave you. So I see Lucille's ready to go. Well, at, as the nonprofit, I, I have to say the work that the finance lab does is excellent. Um, it's high quality work and it's respected certainly throughout the financial community, the CDFIs, the bankers, they all take this stuff pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, when they started with us, they actually helped us to go public because as a part of the development, they told us like, you know, you got to go let all your elected officials know what you're doing. They really pumped us up on that part. You know, part of it, a lot of times you're there working in your office, little busy bee, and you're not letting everybody know what you're doing, but they were really like, go meet with every elected official, get letters of support from everybody, you know, get everybody, you know, really revved up. And it was a lot of energy, and that, that was great. That, that really fed into the success of the project. Um, one of the other things that they did really early on was talking about the project with a lot of people so that a lot of people knew about it and that they had gotten some market research and they talked to us and they said well you know if you move out of some of these retail spaces you're in that would help you to pay for your um, your, 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 your mortgage so this would all work out. Um, the Wait. final thing I have to say is since you're now at you know Furman in the law school, a similar type of program is really needed in the law school arena for people to really help nonprofits understand what the low income housing tax credit structure is, what their obligations are, in a way different from what attorneys do. Because when attorneys come in for your closing, they just say, oh yeah, I'm protecting you. You don't even know, need to know what these you know, 10,000 pages really mean. <laughs> well, and, that, that's worked real well. Right. And um, you know, you, you, we really need someone, just like the finance lab helps nonprofits to have at least the one person that they're working with, if right. not more people within the organization, understand the deal a little better. Right. But that really doesn't happen with um, the tax credits on the legal side. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to propose maybe NYU and Milano work together here. Uh, that, there you that's go. beyond my, uh, pay, <laughs> my pay grade, as they say. So, uh, but that's a great idea to, to bring in more legal talent here. And, and, oh, 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 I have one more point. I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. I have to say this one. This lab really grows entrepreneurs. We saw yeah. some of them here today. And the former uh, person who I, I went through the lab with, uh, Kevin Walters, he owns mm -hmm. a restaurant, Creole, up on 119th Street. He's in love with New Orleans, too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, Dave, uh, what's your thoughts about the experience you had and what, what needs might you have today and can the lab still be helpful to you? Sure, I, I think uh, in, in terms of where uh, our needs would be moving forward, I, this type of help is, uh, is very difficult to find. I mean, the, again, the quality of the team that we worked with, uh, both in terms of their uh, the financial analysis, uh, they did do some legal and regulatory review for us, uh, which was outstanding. And then the quality of their uh, presentation to a group of uh, very high-ranking executive uh, funders was top-notch. So I would certainly sustain on, on all of those. Um, there was nothing, when I looked at the curriculum list there, it, it felt to me pretty comprehensive in terms of the kinds of needs that we would have going forward, looking at uh, specific properties and, and financing. Uh, one of the perhaps interesting opportunities is to look at new programs as they're coming on board. I know that nonprofits uh, in particular uh, will t often take some time to be able to get up to speed on different programs. New Jersey has a, a groundbreaking uh, tax credit program, the Urban Transit Hub Tax Credit, uh, which folks are scrambling to understand and, and figure out and under to see what it could mean in their communities. So if I were to pick one area that might be interesting going forward, it might be to, to look for uh, new programs that are coming online, particularly in the area of tax credits and finance, and, uh, and look to model something around that. 
That's great. Dina, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, just quickly. Um, I, there's a couple things I could think of, but probably the most urgent now for us is now that there's this recognition, thanks in part to Milano's help, of this big problem, this huge housing crisis in New York City, which probably will start to show up in other markets, particularly hot markets around the country. Um, previously hot markets. Previously hot markets. <laughs> we need to move into a sort of from crisis to solution. And one of the solutions that we've been struggling with is uh, we're going to need to identify socially responsible pools of capital that can turn this problem into an opportunity, right? So a lot of housing that was affordable that was lost could be recaptured uh, and turned around into stabilized affordable housing through all kinds of different mechanisms. And I think there's been a political will coming from both the federal government and from the local government here to figure out ways to re-restrict that housing. In some cases to maybe go further in terms of affordability restrictions than were true before or they were over leveraged and bought out. Um, but in order to do this, we need a flexible pool of capital that frankly would have to be a little bit more agile than what government currently can do. That, you know, they don't move fast, they don't move quick, and there is a second tier of speculation out there that I think is competing to sort of recapture this housing. They think they can get some deals out of this. And so we should be in a position, and I think Milano would be a great tool for this, the finance lab would be a great tool for identifying these sort of flexible agile pools of capital that, that have a lower expectation on return that would sort of commit to helping re-stabilize and recapture some of this housing. That's a great idea. So um, let me just second that. I think that's okay. a, that is a great idea. Right. Uh, Brian, do you want to add anything to this uh, conversation? Um, in my current situation in the hat I'm wearing now where I'm working with a, a federal program uh, foreclosures, um, redevelopment of abandoned um, homes and properties, residential properties around the state. I think what's really hitting me hard after the last year or so is the fact that subsidies are shrinking as everyone knows and we've all become dependent upon subsidies to pr provide the capital to do very traditional kinds of redevelopment, yeah. rehab. I mean it's shrinking, and I think it would be great if the lab might have some students uh, who are interested in sort of thinking of models beyond the current way we produce housing. Um, the cost of housing is so great that it's almost shocking to see how much we have to subsidize each mm -hmm. house yeah. to make it affordable yeah. for the target population. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I could go on, but I mean, I think it'd be a, maybe an interesting area for for the lab to think about. I, I, I just, uh, again, a great, <laughs> a great area. I, I just want to make an observation here that uh, sort of a little bit of a dose of reality. These are students, right? And I think as we learn from Amber, they learn a lot over the course, uh, <laughs> over the course of the course, mm -hmm. the course of these uh, uh, experiences. And uh, we really do owe something very special to the faculty advisors here. because I think yeah. that's what yeah. allows yeah. I mean, I'm sure you're great clients and you know exactly what you want and stuff, but, you know, and, and the faculty, <laughs> how do I know that? Um, the faculty uh, really is great and we owe that to Blaze and, and, and his team uh, there to be able to do this. Now, uh, Ulysses, uh, we've already told all the wonderful story about what you do. Uh, uh, we were worried about if you were okay because we knew you were on your way. We know already that you have a three o'clock phone call that you have to be on. <laughs> <laughs> right with Tom, so we've been right through your almost your whole life history yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to hit you with something uh, a little uh, different here, which is um, now that you've got this incredible facility and, and um, it's opened. Is that right? Uh, um, at the end of August. End of August. All yes. right. Uh, What's next? And is there something that the finance lab might even be able to help you with? And uh, as you'll notice here, to be very unfair, we're way over time, all right, because these other people spoke way before, w into our panel time. Um, and, um, and we're supposed to open this up for questions, so this is my opportunity just to mention that if other people have questions of the panelists, we will get to that in a second here. But give us your thoughts. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say this. I don't know whether Tom Manning when he was presenting in, in my stead, had mentioned this to you, but uh, when we first uh, met with uh, the Milano team, uh, we were focusing on a condo uh, project that would occupy a parcel, a part of the parcel of land that we have, which would accommodate both the health center as well as this condo. 
and uh, we had identified a private developer uh, who had assembled a team who would um, uh, move forward with uh, the condominium project. And the Milano Group uh, came in with uh, their pictorial representation of, of their vision of, of this condo project. And we were so impressed with it. And what happened is that we were showing it to some of the politicians in the area. And I mean, the, 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 the pictures that they had in their package uh, were so sunny and what have you, and uh, they had never seen anything like it in, 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 in Bed-Stuy. They said, wow, this is really great. And so then they also said, well, look, now this is for profit here, so maybe we could capture this some way uh, in terms of our health center that we also need to in, in, in this community, which would also occupy a, a part of the plot of land that we had. So what happened was that we shared the package that we'd gotten from the Milano team with our architect, and they stole or swiped <laughs> some of the uh, ideas that were included in, in that package. And uh, as a result, if you look at our building here, I mean, you would see that it's airy and, and it's very sunny. They're all, we did our best to capture all the sunlight. It's eco-friendly, it's green. And the other thing is that uh, the development group that was going to pursue the condo project, they are beginning to reassemble. Uh, I think they were affected by the uh, downturn in the real estate market, which everybody is, is acquainted with, but now there seems to be some resurgence, and so they are reassembling, and we're going to move forward with that too. But this project here will be completed uh, uh, by the end of August. We should be there no later than early September. And um, we're coming to your ribbon, ribbon cutting too. You're going to oh, invite yeah, everybody. Uh, absolutely. Right. The, the other thing I, I did want to say is that uh, we would not have had uh, this health center in the manner that it's being presented here, uh, had it not been for the uh, package that had been developed by the Milano team. So it, this is a pivotal result of, of their ideas and what have you, but we also going to be capturing as much as we possibly can in the condo project, which the private developers right. are, are going to be moving forward with. Terrific, terrific. So, great projects. These are all great people, too. You get a sense of if they had all started the finance lab, they probably wouldn't have had to go through all the jobs they did to be as good as they are. But um, <laughs> obviously, a, a wealth of experience is really what makes you very successful in just, the development world. I'm sorry. So. May I just add one more thing, too? You may, and Lucille has yeah, her hand just, up, too. I just, so. just wanted to say this. You know, it's, it's, it's a little more difficult for people to identify with, with a concept uh, than it is for them to relate to uh, a package or a, a, visual. a picture right. and what yeah. have you. That, that's right. And so when we show them the the Milano uh, package with all the bright pictures and what have you and children sitting in the living room and what have you, uh, we were able to uh, bring in our first five million dollars on our uh, so who knew Milano's great skill, the finance lab, is marketing, right? So a whole other, it was mentioned earlier, obviously key part. Lucille. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I, I thought one of the most uh, professional things about this is, you know, I've worked with a number of university programs, graduate students, etc. But I don't know if it's the faculty or the students or the combination, but projects get finished on time by the end of the semester. Right. I've worked with students in other instances where the students never finish the project, <laughs> and if you're lucky, maybe they have another new student the following semester pick it up and try to wrap it up, which is really kind of messy. That's a great question. I mean, great point. I was going to ask a question if you, any of you had experiences <laughs> with others, because yeah, this yeah. seems amongst all of the kinds mm -hmm. of uh, interactions that I know students well-meaning come to do in a community, yeah. uh, th this seems to have an incredible track record of mm -hmm. getting things done on time. Um, and on budget or whatever, so. Even though we're good. 20 minutes over schedule. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> we haven't used up all the time you set us back. That's so, true. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> oh. So, so <laughs> previous to this, Blaze said we could have two questions. If there aren't any, that's fine. But does anybody in the audience like to ask the panel some one or two questions? Oh, oh. <laughs> all right. Blaze, here. Yeah. Um, 
Please identify yourself. I want to get at funding. Please identify yourself. I'm, I'm Denise Beal. I'm a graduate of the lab. I am a partner with the lab in helping to develop um, a similar curriculum in New Orleans at the University of New Orleans. Um, and I, I just want to get at funding. Um, and, and so really, I'm probably directing this to yourself and Brian, right? Yeah. Understanding that you're not a funder anymore, no, but you understand that world. Sure. Um, as the finance lab continues to go forward, you know, we have an example of an incident here, a, a situation here where Casey was interested in a particular um, area that Casey's making an investment in in Camden, and so they saw an opportunity here to finance or fund the lab to work on a project related to something they were already doing. Brian talked about, you know, him uh, through HSBC, I believe it was, bringing resources to the lab, but again, having the opportunity to kind of identify a project, and you have um, benefited, which, you, by the way, I, I, I love the, you know, keeping affordable of DJ Cool Herc's, uh, you know, the, the, the development that he lived in in the Bronx as a result of this work. Um, I think that was just in, in really important <laughs> for an old hip hop head. Um, but, you know, and, and, and then it was different early on, I think, those, you know, earlier on. I don't want to date you or me, right? I was in the second cohort of the finance lab. Right. Earlier on, Funders came at the lab with operating support. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily just project focused. And I think as we, you know, think about how do we learn from the last 10 years and what do we, you know, need to learn from that to move forward for the next 10 years, this work takes money. The tuition, which is pretty high at Milano, <laughs> doesn't necessarily cover a lot of the cost of the lab. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're always, you know, as Janetta Cole used to say, you know, shaking our tin can. Um, so, so, you know, you guys, the, the rest of you who, you know, don't sit in the funding world know that you're out there also and, and Milano <laughs> helps you in terms of pulling together funding for your projects. What is it that we need to understand, I think, over the next three to ten years about where funding for initiatives like this um, at universities because we want them to be institutionalized, right? Um, what are the things we need to understand moving forward so we can strategically position this program? M myself, I'm thinking we need to figure out an endowment, but other than that, right, right. how do we think about longevity, institutionalization, you know, here, um, in New Orleans, you know, so they can continue to develop the professionals, okay. et cetera. Let's get, to, let's get the panel. I see Dave wants to uh, weigh in, in, then Brian. I had spoken to uh, Roger Williams last week, who felt very sorry that he wasn't able to make it from the Casey Foundation. He did ask me to convey this with regard to the issue of funding. Uh, Casey Foundation got involved with the Greater Camden Partnership on this project not because of the project itself but because of our geography and the alignment of this project um, with our strategic mission and then uh, because of the geography with their, their strategic interests in, uh, in Camden. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things to think about, this doesn't get to your question of how do we go beyond project funding, but specific to the issue of project funding, uh, there are, uh, most funders that I've dealt with have that similar approach. And, you know, one of the ways you might look at it is where are there funders who have selected the two or three or four or five cities that are in their portfolio of a specific issue related to something that Milano uh, might find as a project and go after those sources. I don't think it's a zero sum where uh, those dollars aren't going to the nonprofit, but instead, uh, Casey in this case added additional funding because it was something that was supplemental. So, uh, you know, certainly that approach of alignment is uh, is something to sustain. Brian? I think I was just going to say something similar, which is that to the extent that the financial community in New Orleans, the developer community, the investment community, has a, a stake in revitalizing the city after what it's been through, the notion of capacity building of partners that they rely on in, or should be relying on is 
is maybe more conceptual than supporting the project, but I think there are ways you can link those two together. So we should the developer fees that all of these projects have have garnered and go to the go to the developers and say you've made 20 million dollars on these projects over the last five years and you needed the community group to get it done and we worked with the community group to help you advance these projects however yeah however you weave yourself into that calculus. those are tough those are tough right let's start yes uh, right. I was just oh. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we do live in a political world, and um, I think uh, the politicians that I've met, each of them is looking for a winner. They're always looking for something that they can point at and say, hey, look like uh, I had something to do with that. And so, <laughs> uh, so aside from looking at support from the uh, private foundation sector, I s certainly would implore you to uh, consider uh, rallying your, uh, your political uh, representatives around your, your ideas and what have you. And um, I think that um, it, the atmosphere in, in Washington right now seems to be uh, ripe for that, And unless I'm missing a beat somewhere, but it seems to be ripe for that. And I, I'm sure that you're pushing your buttons and what have you, but I didn't, I came in late, but I didn't hear that mentioned. But I do feel that you need to, <coughs> to, um, uh, m make sure that uh, the, the people down in Washington who also control some purse strings are aware of the, are aware of the good work that you're doing and you've got to just take them on a, on a flight with you. Uh, Jerry, right. I'll just add that I think that you're, you're spot on to this issue of alignment between kind of uh, philanthropy and the federal government and really thinking about how kind of philanthropy leverages those public sector resources. Um, and I think that we need to think about creatively. I mean, w one of the things that we were concerned when, when Milano came to us, they had done a number of projects in New Orleans. We'll talk about that uh, in the next panel. But we were really concerned about kind of and interested in kind of the long-term sustainability of this model, right? And so I think what we'd like to talk, uh, we should think about how kind of philanthropy partners with the federal government, with the public sector to really create kind of local hubs <laughs> for this work, right? So the issue of replicability um, is really, really important. Um, and the issue of kind of donor collaboration is really in coordination, right? Um, I think that there are a number of spaces in which uh, national philanthropy, both uh, philanthropy like Ford and Casey and the corporate philanthropy come together and can really think about how we can incubate and build on this existing models in some of the other place-based strategies. So I think about other spaces like living cities um, as an opportunity that's place-based to think about. So if if this model works, how do we kind of embed it in other communities so that we're building infrastructure, a national infrastructure, right, that's able to support this work over the long haul? So it's a, I think that's going to be our last question. Uh, but we, do you have, a, you have a comment on this this issue here, or you want? Uh, for the we really don't have time for another question. But she's, she's from, from she, New Orleans. So, Therefore, so we, we have all the time. So before, <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> before we change the topic, I, I just want to, so there, there are a whole bunch of issues that you raise here. One is the money to get annual operating, you know, some idea of how to get an endowment. Um, and I think, you know, the, the sources of money are basically grants and, you know, whether it's from the philanthropic or government or uh, uh, the corporate philanthropy, those are all areas to go and I think Jerry uh, and others have outlined some, some good strategies about how to do it and, you know, I think making the case like this gives people a sense of that. It's also helpful if you can think of some revenue generating ideas, so I, I don't know, but since you asked me, one idea that I, I would consider when there's a project, not when you're doing advocacy, but uh, when there's a project project, put a contingent liability, so to speak, on it, say if this thing ever gets built, we want to get paid back, here's the amount of money of uh, pre-development. A lot of pre-development expenses are covered <coughs> here, and given the way you're approaching this, you don't need the money up front, but it'd be great if you had it up later on, and you could, that could help do an endowment and, and, and keep it going, because uh, philanthropic dollars are tough, and you're always, it's always, always a struggle, so be nice if somehow, and I'm, maybe that's unrealistic, you can get at least a little bit of revenue here when yeah. success is demonstrated. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, so please. Uh, uh, I'm Denise Strong from uh, New Orleans, University of New Orleans. I'm interested in, I'd like to hear some of your comments about um, 
where you were developmentally as organizations, long-standing organizations, and understanding and navigating the political environment um, for your project if you needed to do that. And whether the lab or a lab-like entity, whether you needed assistance in figuring that out or uh, whether that was even necessary. You might have already figured all of that out so you did not need a, uh, a community development lab to help you think through, let's say, a political strategy or navigating the political and bureaucratic kinds of mazes that are needed in any kind of work in, um, in a community. So I'd be interested in hearing some of your comments about that and whether you think let's say in a city like New Orleans, and we might be working with organizations that are not as well developed, but whether you think that's something we need to think about as we develop our curriculum and, and develop ourselves in offering this new curriculum. Well, HCCI is very well versed in talking with all of our elected officials, but the lab did push us to do it early rather than later. A lot of times we go do that, we're really asking them for some money. But when we did it in this instance, we were just asking them for support so that when we came back and asked for the money, they already knew the project, had said, oh, how wonderful it was, had written that down. And then we came back and asked for money, they were like, oh, yeah, that's the project I said was so great. I guess I got to give you something. <laughs> that's a great strategy. Right. Any other? I would just quickly say, uh, similarly, you have had sort of, because we do advocacy, we have a sense of it, but one of the things we've learned uh, that is like sort of drugs to elected officials is, is data. You know, if you can show them a map with their district, with where the problems are, what the needs are, they just love it. Can I get a copy of that map? Where did I get that map? Uh, and so what Milana was good at doing was helping us put that data into a sort of comprehensible, easy to understand, and again, you know, in fairness to the elected officials, they can't be experts on every issue and housing is particularly complicated. So this was very useful in, in making this very palatable to the elected official community who we already had good relationships with. So uh, the, the, the uh, a, a political community needs to see numbers, they need to see pictures. Pictures. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and they need to hear from you early. So, and often maybe, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that all seems to fit together and make a lot of sense. Does that help you with your question? Yes, and so, um, I, I uh, also wanted to hear from you whether you thought how, like how important, let's say for a new program that's just beginning, how important is that aspect or is the technical dimension much more important? I mean, what would you say about do you that? Need, do you need government funding in the end? <laughs> For your project, if it, if you do, it seems to me that answers the question. Well, I think though the a point that needs to be made, and this is something I would be very cautious about, is that uh, I mean, lo local politics is you know is tough business, and it takes a lot of time on the ground to really know it. Uh, we've been in situations not with the finance lab, but with other university programs, uh, where students have tried to wade into that space, and it's a very very difficult space for students to operate in. I think the what my fellow panelists suggested as the right approach there in terms of maybe some broad overall strategies, being able to provide the data, but I think uh, I would I would shy away from taking the students too far down a road where they would have an expectation of being able to get in there and, and really manage the politics. I I, I think I, it's just no. th that's a little bit too much education. Yeah, yeah. I think. No, that's right. <laughs> All right. Any more comments? If not, I want to thank the panel. That's a terrific. Day.